and welcome to Trusty Chords, the music podcast which aims to celebrate music and those that create it. If you're someone who has your finger on the pulse of the world of jazz, then Audrey Pound is a name that you might be aware of. If hers isn't a name that you know just yet, well, you definitely need to listen to today's podcast. Based in the UK but originally from Melbourne, Audrey is an artist, producer and multi-instrumentalist who has been aptly described as a creative force carving out a distinctive path in the worlds of future jazz and soul. Having been drawn to jazz at a young age, Audrey honed her craft in the vibrant Melbourne music scene amongst the likes of Hiatus Coyote and 3070 and can now be found performing in some of the most visionary musical circles globally. A prolific artist and a stalwart of the Melbourne jazz and soul scenes, which has seen her leading various pop projects including the synth-pop duo Audrey and sweet soul band Leisure Centre as both a vocalist and a trumpeter, Audrey released her debut solo album From the Fire on April 26th. If you haven't listened to it yet, you're soon going to be hearing my recommendation. Alongside her own career, you can also find Audrey touring with big names like the Teskey Brothers. In fact, that's what she was doing when she took the time to have a chat with me from the UK for this latest episode of the Trusty Chords podcast. Check out Audrey Pound's debut album, From the Fire, and once you're done giving that a spin, have a listen to our chat, and I'll see you at the end of the episode for some general housekeeping. Audrey Pound, thank you very much for joining this episode of Trusty Chords. Thank you for having me. Now, to introduce yourself to people who might not know your name, could you give me a quick few words on who you are and, I guess, why you're here today? Um, Well, I'm an artist originally from Melbourne, but now based out of London. I've been a trumpet player for over 10 years, but I'm also a composer and a producer and a vocalist. And uh, I've just put out my debut album, from the fire, my debut solo album, um, on a UK label BBE, which is very exciting. So basically, you're you're someone who is just so, so infuriatingly talented oh. that the rest of us just pale in comparison. No, I think maybe the term is uh, jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> um, yeah, easily distracted, maybe. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's something I think I can definitely relate to. Um, (laughs) So this podcast is centered around a love of music. So what I like to do for the start is go back to where it all began for you. So as such, I'd love to say, or I'd love to ask you, do you have any particular early memories of when music first resonated with you? I really do. Um, I always loved music and I don't say that in a way to try and make my sound like self sound like I feel like I have some sort of innate talent or gift because I don't I'm I'm a person that uh performing always came quite naturally to me but I I worked really hard at music from a young age especially the trumpet um you know it was it's a lot of practice um but yeah when I was young my mum used to watch a lot of MGM musicals you know with Frank Sinatra and Gene Kelly and I loved Frank Sinatra <laughs> a lot. And I think that sort of also it's all the great American songbook stuff. Um, I really absorbed that. And then I became obsessed with this movie, High Society, which has um, Frank Sinatra and Big Crosby in it and Grace Kelly. But then it also has Louis Armstrong. So I think all of it that I absorbed so much and subconsciously uh, when I was offered an opportunity to play the trumpet at school, I sort of gravitated towards that. But I was lucky I I started piano lessons when I was four years old and I had an amazing teacher, um, Diana, who lived up the road from me in the town that I'm from. And, yeah, I, I started really young because I think my brother started playing guitar and I thought it was unfair that he got to do something (laughs) but I didn't want to do the same thing so yeah I chose piano and uh but yeah it was I remember loving it from the start so you mentioned that you got into the trumpet in at at school so what was it about the trumpet that appealed to you well (laughs) I think it was subconsciously I knew what it was because I'd seen Louis Armstrong playing it in the movies um and it was free (laughs) And uh, I knew that I could probably convince my mum because of that. Uh, And, yeah, it was just, it was, someone came to my primary school, you know, Country Victoria. I can't quite remember how it was connected, but I think it might have had something to do with one of the, like, municipal brass bands, you know, those kind of local concert bands. So they had instruments that we could take home. Um, And I think 
you didn't have to pay very much. I think it was like you paid $100 to hire the instrument for the year or something, you got lessons for free. So it was just, yeah, it was just sort of a chance. And um, luckily my mum is was always very supportive despite how loud I'm sure it was um, in the house. But, yeah, once I started trumpet as well, I really loved it. And, yeah, I... Yeah, because I already played piano, I didn't have to learn to read music. I already knew how to do that. So I was in like year six, I think. But because I didn't have the struggle of learning to read music, it was quite easy for me to pick up the trumpet and get going. So I think the the, the question I have there then is, so you started learning piano at about four and trumpet in about year six or so. So in that sort of young period where you're watching things like High Society, watching Louis Armstrong and everything, were you the sort of person to actually be looking at that and saying, this music game, this is something I want to get into one day? Honestly, in a way, yes. In another way, I was delusional and really thought that I was going to be a a triple threat star. (laughs) Like, which didn't really exist anymore, but, like, I was really into dancing as a kid as well. So, yeah, I just wanted to do it all. But I do remember in year seven we had to do, like, a class project of, like, what we wanted our job to be when we grew grew up, and everyone in my class did, uh, like, doctor, basically, (laughs) or um, lawyer, and I said I wanted to be a pop star and like did quite a serious year seven school project about it which now looking back is kind of mortifying but anyway I mean it's completely fair because I I mean I think if you look through my old yearbooks you'll see when I was about you know six or so I said I want to grow up and be a musician which was a little bit more respectable than the kid who said I want to grow up and be Superman yeah, yeah so, there you go exactly didn't, didn't really work out for him yeah <laughs> um I was a real fantasist as a child though like I would you know um perform in front of my windows as a mirror and like lots of miming and like I was really into Michael Jackson as well and like wanted to be that and all singing all that thing yeah so that was actually the next question I had you know were there any particular artists that you used to listen to a lot because you obviously mentioned the likes of you know the MGM musicals now Michael Jackson were there any other artists around that time that you were really sort of like hey this is the sort of music I'm really digging I want to sort of follow this along yeah I don't know if it was directly related to me wanting to do music but it's a huge influence on me now and I've always been in love with the Beatles particularly Paul McCartney um and my mum had yeah and as a young girl I really it was Paul or nothing at all (laughs) like uh I really love and I still I still really think that those records are just so incredible and uh particularly for me the White Album my mum had a copy of the White Album and she put it onto cassette for me. She didn't want me touching her records. Um, and, yeah, I just remember listening to that and, like, I had a little cassette Walkman, like Sony Walkman, and I would pretend to be asleep and just listen to the White Album like, really, really late at night. Yeah. Uh, and I still, uh, like, the Beatles were an influence on the album I've just made. I mean, the Beatles just influence everything, so I, I love that. And then Michael, it was Michael Jackson and the Beatles for me. And then I really loved the song The Girl Is Mine that Paul McCartney and Michael Jackson did together. Best of both worlds, yeah. Best of both worlds. And I know it's cheesy, but I also think it's a jam. Oh, yeah. No, it, it really is. But I was actually going to say, you mentioned the White Album. I mean, that's, that's definitely a bit of an album that's a little bit, I guess, it's not their most accessible album because you've got things like, um, I'm forgetting, Revolution 9 on there, for example. Yeah. Sort of breaks yeah. up the breaks up the little pop sheen that they had going and, and stuff, you know. Yeah, I, I think it was just the first. Oh no, it wasn't the first Beatles album I heard. The first one was Abbey Road, um, but I think oh, there's. I think because I was still a kid as well, like I was still younger than ten. There's, you know, I don't know if people know the Al- White Album that deep, but there's like Rocky Raccoon, mm-hmm. which as a kid you're like, oh, this is a cool little song, and I remember loving. Um, the song Ringo sings at the end of, I think it's the end of Side One, um, Good Night, that's very Disney and cinematic. I loved that so much and I would listen to it every night before I went to sleep because I just found it so comforting, even though now maybe it's a bit creepy, Ringo style whispering like, good night, everybody. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and then I loved the bangers, you know, back in the USSR. Oh, yeah. That. I love that book. Ha- I-, I remember loving Happiness is a Wall Done, which now, like, I remember playing that with some friends a few years ago and realizing it's really heavy. 
in weird, weird form and yeah. But I, I think that's why I love the White Album because it's got it's got a, some real classics from each member of the band as well. It's very it's very quirky and because they're so long and there's so many tracks, it's it's a whole journey. I love that. That's my favorite Beatles record. Oh, it's it's such a great album. I mean, honestly, I could talk about every Beatles album all day, but we're here to talk about Order of Town, not the Beatles. <laughs> yeah, we should. <laughs> I could definitely talk about the Beatles. So the other question I had, because you obviously mentioned that you started like um, learning trumpet around like year six or so. So when did you first get into performing as well? When did that come about? Because you obviously mentioned you was doing things from a young age as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I did a lot of dancing, which involved a lot of performances. But then um, I grew up in West Gippsland, and they had these Estedfords, like West Gippsland, uh, West Gippsland Performing Arts at Bedford or something. And I did, I, my teacher enrolled me in those one year. I think I did two piano solos and a trumpet solo and I won all three. And that was just like the best feeling in the world. <laughs> Even though now I'm like winning music is a bit of a um, weird thing. But I do remember like this is just true, getting feedback that, um, you know, my feel for music and my performance maybe overcame other like was more impactful than some other young young people that had more technical ability than me. I sort of was able to perform my way through that, and that's definitely been my story. Uh, I, I have done a lot of practice and a lot of technical training. Uh, obviously, I went to uni, which I don't take for granted at all. But I, I'm a highly trained musician now, but it was always uh, technique was always a struggle for me. It didn't come naturally. Yeah, right. It's, it's definitely the sort of thing that takes a lot of like honing in to sort of like really, really learn it, doesn't it? Because it's, it's not the sort of thing that yeah that comes yeah. naturally for a lot of people. Yeah, and in hindsight, I'm I, I think musicality, like oh, it's a hard thing to say about yourself, but understanding of music and I think because I loved it so much came quite naturally. So then it was always trying to catch up with my technique, and it still is. I'm just trying to get my technique to catch up to my ears and what I can conceptualize um and as I'm actually quite grateful for that now in hindsight now that I'm a bit older because I didn't have a choice not to practice so especially when I was at uni I practiced a lot and that's just uh given me this this basis and uh you know work ethic is kind of the wrong term but I like I like practicing and I I that's part of the process that I really enjoy so I'm kind of glad that I was forced into that by just struggling technically maybe <laughs> no that's that's definitely understandable it's certainly understandable actually so the the genre that you're most associated with is obviously jazz so that's the I don't think the way to uh, sort of uh approach the question I had when did you first really get into jazz was that sort of as a result of the MGM sort of musicals and sort of growing on from there or was it something else I think it was I think that was subconsciously there for me I knew a lot of songs which definitely helped me and then I think when I started playing the trumpet because the trumpet is so associated with jazz people like family members you know someone bought me kind of blue for Christmas or something like that I can't quite remember to be honest um but I started realizing that that was the, the sort of trumpet music that I liked definitely more than classical trumpet. And then I think the more I loved playing the trumpet, the more I searched out jazz. And it was ha- actually hard for me to find, like, my mum was into George Benson and Grover Washington Jr. and Al Jarreau and a lot of, like, smooth jazz, which I love. But, um, yeah, I mean, I really... I started just listening to James Brown and Frank Sinatra and my mum's record. And then when I got a bit older and um, had my own money and things like that, like started working I, uh, and I would do Melbourne Youth Music, I would go to JB Hi-Fi and at the time they would sell like three Blue Note CDs for $20. Yeah, I so remember that. I would that. sort of beg mum for $20 and I would just pick three that had trumpet players on them and I didn't know anything about it but I was just very lucky that most Blue Note records are incredible (laughs) and I got it's all those ones from the 60s so I got like Kenny Dorham and like Lee Morgan and Freddie Hubbard so then I was probably like 15 16 and I was like I just thought Lee Morgan was the coolest thing ever and those you know they all had really cool album covers and then in the in sleeve there's these pictures of these guys all like they're dressed so clean in suits and 
yeah, that's sort of how I, I got into it more and more. And then I was really lucky um, to have a teacher in high school who actually is a saxophone player who was teaching at my high school and heard me practicing. Like, I, I think I'd bought a book of transcriptions because I didn't know how to learn jazz. So I just bought this book at like Ellen's Music that said like, you know, Winter Marsalis transcriptions. And I was trying to sight read them to learn them, which is ridiculous now. But I didn't know. And he heard me practicing. He was just like, what are you doing? Like, oh, you're into this? Like, let me tell you how it's done. And he just taught me without, you know, uh, free of charge. I used to go and see him at lunchtime. His name is Tony Hicks, incredible saxophone player. He's been in the art orchestra, the Melbourne Sky Orchestra, a number of things. And he just taught me how to practice and learn how to improvise and that was game changing and then he introduced me to a whole bunch of other music and Australian jazz and by the time I was in year 12 I just wanted to be an Australian jazz musician uh, you know I remember begging my mum to take me to Bennett's Lane to see gigs and then that was all I that was what I wanted, just wanted, just wanted. <laughs> and now I am <laughs> It's all, it's, you know, it's all about manifesting that and sort of, you know, if you can dream it, you can be it sort of thing. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Obviously without undermining the hard work that's involved. Yeah, true, true. So this is me speaking from my own experiences here, but, you know, especially with teenagers who are into music. But if I told them I was not only into jazz, but actively playing it, I might have had a hard time convincing them, having a hard time convincing them that that's the sort of, you know, music that's uh, that's worth taking a chance on. Was that something that you faced at all? Yeah, I, I definitely wavered a little bit. There was a there was a real moment for me. It's one of the only times I had a real crystal clear like this has changed everything for me. And I I think I've told this story to people, but I uh, was at worked at Knox City, which is like a Westfield basically in um, uh, the suburbs in Mel- in Melbourne in Venture Gully, uh, and I would have breaks and go to Borders Books and Music. And I don't know if anyone that's old enough to remember that, you could scan CDs there and listen to 30 seconds. And I was just looking for anything in the jazz section that was a trumpet player. And I saw this really amazing album cover and I looked on the back and it was like literally the like coolest looking hottest guy I'd ever seen holding a trumpet. It was Roy Hargrove. And it was this RH Factor album. Um, called Hard Groove and I scanned it and I listened to 30 seconds and I just kept doing and scanning it and then I would go and work at this Italian restaurant I think I was doing work experience actually anyway but I was like go and work these horrible shifts at this Italian restaurant and then just like as soon as my shift was over I just go and listen to this 30 second snippet in Borders Books and Music until I saved up (laughs) $35.95 to buy that CD and then I would have been year 10 like 16 and then I took it home and I just listened to that record all the time and I didn't know the artists that were on it but it was D'Angelo, Erica Badu, Common, Q-Tip so it introduced me to hip-hop and to neo soul and it just like from that moment on that was sort of all I cared about and it kind of hasn't changed really still i'm just so grateful that i found that record when i did so that was actually a record which uh, i i guess i should say for transparency for anyone listening um i i briefly well, recently interviewed you for gig life pro and that was an album that you mentioned yeah. on a little interview and i, I checked that out and it's yeah. an amazing record i i, I always it's love incredible. hearing records like that or hearing from artists about the records they recommend and that was such a great record to listen to and yeah i can only imagine how influential that was I, especially just being led by a trumpet player and uh, the way that Roy Hargrove plays the trumpet changed changed my life. Like I just love his tone so much, and yeah, a- and I think he doesn't get that re- that record specifically doesn't get the sort of credit that it deserves for really like fueling a lot of the stuff that's happening now with with new newer jazz. You know, um, I think everyone I know definitely from Melbourne that is making that sort of future soul jazz stuff was influenced by that record and I think uh Robert Glasper sort of took that um hip-hop uh jazz crossover thing and and ran with it and I know that his biggest influence was Roy so Roy is sort of the guy that was a bit too early like he did it just before it became really cool and I in my opinion didn't quite get the credit for what he did for so many people my generation that are playing music that that record and his music really changed our idea of what we could do as, or what you could do in the space of 
jazz, you know, and improvising, but it didn't have to be swing. It didn't, you know, you could blend with other genres. And I, I think it helped a lot of us discover a lot of hip hop. Because that's the thing. Like, I know that jazz is such a divisive genre for those who aren't fans of it. Like, a lot of folks listen to the likes of John Coltrane, and Miles Davis, and they just think it sounds like noise sometimes. Like, they don't understand the improvisation, the like a lot of the theory that's behind it, or the the ignoring of the theory that's behind it. Um, so, do you ever have any artists that you recommend to people to sort of say, "Hey, this is a great starting point if you want to check out jazz"? Yeah, I think I think jazz is like terribly misunderstood. And I feel like I, I'm really into visual art as well. My mum was a visual, like an art teacher and a visual artist who took me to a lot of galleries and talked me through why these weird Picasso paintings and Jackson Pollock and modern art like that, why it meant something because it was original. And I sort of feel like the same discussion needs to be had with jazz. And it's transcendent music. It's extemporaneous. You know, I think... Uh, it takes time and it takes patience and you have to, it's like reading a novel, you know, you have to, you have to commit to it to get anything out of it. But if you do, you're probably going to get more than something that you have on in the background. And I think it's funny, it, it always shocks me that jazz has become background music because it, I can't have Miles Davis playing in the background. I can't, like when I'm in a cafe, I can't have a conversation have that in the background because it just demands my attention and I, I maybe that sounds incredibly pretentious but I think jazz is pretentious because it requires a level of attention and investment and and like ability on your instrument that is quite you know someone like John Coltrane who spent his life just just practicing it's an infinite pursuit and yeah, I think that there's so many rewards in, in listening to it, but you, you need to take the time. And I guess some people will and some people won't. Yeah, that was a bit of a rambling answer. <laughs> oh, not at all. I mean, I completely understand what you're saying about how it feels like a pretentious thing to say, but it's certainly not. Like years ago, I went and saw um, the Sydney trio, The Necks, who are one of my favourites. Oh groups of all time i absolutely yeah. love them like seeing them live is such an amazing experience and i took a friend of mine who i thought we had a very similar sort of taste in music he appreciated a lot of like improvisational stuff he watched it and he was just like yeah it's good but yeah and i was just and i, I just wanted to say to him like all right buddy <laughs> meet me out back in five yeah. where we're, we're gonna have yeah, you know yeah. i'm i'm gonna bring out the whiteboard we're gonna have a discussion <laughs> sort of thing and but that's the sort of thing like you yeah. really need to focus on it and just sort of allow it to sort of wash over you and experience it as opposed to sort of having it as background yeah. music. Yeah. And, and I think uh, it's also, it's also always going to be not everyone's cup of tea. And of course. Not everyone's going to want to do that. And, and that's, that's also okay. Um, but I think this idea that jazz is like uh, really pretentious guys in four pie hats is, is not, is not real anymore. And yeah, I think the the genre it, it is is growing. But what what drew me to it anyway, and a lot of my friends and my favorite musicians is that it's playing music in the moment. Um, it demands this level of view, of you that is infinite. So there's no end point. It's lifelong. It's purpose. It's art and expression in the moment with other people that you're playing music with, which is why I think it's such an incredible art form um and also it is truly transcendent and i say that having had that experience and knowing uh, people that i've played with and seen people playing that are having that experience when you're in the zone and you can turn your brain off and let all of your muscle memory take over and just play music with people that you trust you're sometimes you feel like you're outside of your body and I, I don't get that feeling very often, but I've had it a few times improvising and it's it's magic. You know, it's the, the best moments of my life. Nothing compares, you know. <laughs> like it's it's such an incredible feeling. And I've had that watching people play improvise as well. Like I remember seeing the Wayne Shorter Quartet in the Melbourne Jazz Festival, which was Wayne Shorter, Brian Blade, who also plays drums with Joni Mitchell and Roy Jones. Um, Danilo Perez and John Patitucci and the four of them were just locked in and it was this magical experience where I sat down and the, 
the concert went for two hours, but I felt like it was like four seconds. It was just so incredible. And yeah, and those guys are just on this other level where they can tap. They, they're so in tune with their instruments, they can tap into that, en- that energy and that transcendence immediately. Uh, it's it's such an amazing experience when you're able to really sort of just I mean not only as a fan to be able to sort of experience that but also just sort of you know knowing that as musicians they are completely lost in the moment and just becoming you know absolute masters of their craft at that time. It's yeah. it's such an amazing experience. I, I I can't sort of use any other words than ex- amazing experience, which makes me feel yeah. like I'm hitting some shortcomings as a journalist. But <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. It's a yeah totally, and it's a it's a really hard thing to describe. Um, but also like as a as a musician i think it, what's incredible like i also play a lot of pop music and i love doing that but it's it's predetermined so you know what the gig is you know what you're going to play before you start whereas when i go and play jazz gig i have no idea what's going to happen and that is terrifying and liberating and exciting and yeah it's that's why i, I love it it's it's, a, it's an amazing experience <laughs> So, I mean, I, I obviously could talk about all of the inspirations all day, and I guess we will a little, little bit later in the trusty chords portion of the podcast, but I should also ask a little bit more about your career. So sort of going chronologically, I guess, you know, how do you go from playing the trumpet to playing in band or in the likes of, say, Leisure Centre? And if I'm, am I pouncing it right when I say Audre? Is that how it's pronounced? Or yes. It, yeah, okay. Sadly, I, yes. I, I, I was always wondering, but yeah. <laughs> so, you know, playing in the likes of Leisure Centre Audre to being one of those pretentious guys in a pork pie hat playing uh, with so many different <laughs> artists. Like, it's such a it, it's such a great and expansive career. So how did this all sort of unfold for you? Oh, I'm so, like, sometimes I think about it, I just can't believe how things have turned out. Um, I feel very lucky. Like Leisure Centre and Audre was sort of uni, like Leisure Centre was kind of a uni band. We were all at VCA together. And um, I was singing with another band. I had, uh, I mean, he's doing amazing things now, Alejandro Abapo, or like his artist name is Silent J. We started this little funk band called the OMGs. (laughs) And we used to play every Monday night at Lucky Cock, which is a bar in um, Paran in Melbourne. And then, you know, we were just playing trumpet and saxophone. He played sax, I played trumpet, doing a bunch of boogaloo instrumental covers. And then there was talk, you know, the band was getting more popular of getting a singer and both of us were like, oh, we'll, we'll sing, we'll sing, we can sing. And we both started singing and both of us still sing to this day. Like uh, JJ, it's like JJ, he's doing BBs with Hiatus Coyote now. Like, yeah. Um, and I'm actually on tour right now with the Teske Brothers with, Olaf Scott, who was the keyboard player from that band. So it was a real time. I mean, he was also in Sasquatch. They were sort of playing at the same time as us. We would support them. And Ketchy was in the first version of Leisure Center, which at the time was called the Do Your Things. Um, yeah, so I think that that all came of sort of out of sort of the uni vibe. And I think Hugh, uh, who sort of wrote a lot of the music for Leisure Center, saw me singing and asked me to do that and it was kind of weird for me to do gigs without my trumpet at first I felt naked <laughs> and terrified but got used to it and then at one stage that band was doing so much I was hardly playing trumpet and then I started Audre with like my very good friend James Bowers sort of I mean I was taking it very seriously but it was sort of it was kind of I don't know we were just having fun it was a bit yeah it started really fun and then we started getting attention started taking it more seriously but it was very fun so you obviously mentioned before like um you know playing with the Teskey brothers so i should say you know before i ask this question i warn you there's a terrible pun involved one you've probably heard a lot but you seem you seem quite humble someone who doesn't usually toot their own horn so i oh. i apologize for how terrible that is but who are some of the other artists that you've worked with because there just seems to be so many like if you look through sort of like some of the credits that you've had it's just sort of like an endless list of great artists yeah I want to be really honest with this answer because when I first started, it was really hard to get a gig. And I don't think, I don't, I don't, this isn't me calling anyone or anything in particular out, just more the social change that happened when Me Too started. Suddenly my phone started ringing. I hadn't suddenly got better at the trumpet, but I was suddenly getting opportunities that I hadn't got before and I'm still confused how much of that 
whether that would have come if that social change hadn't happened. Because I do remember moments of thinking that I wasn't getting any gigs because I couldn't play, which I, I knew wasn't true because I came out of uni playing trumpet really, really strong. It was it took a long time for me to start getting gigs that I thought my peers were getting. So it was it the first five, six years of my career were challenging and upsetting and I found it really, really difficult. And then something changed. I got a couple of gigs and a couple of people saw me play and just gave me opportunities. Um yeah, I, I'm trying to think of where it started, but I can't really pinpoint it. Um, I do remember the Test Brothers was the first sort of big pop band that I played with, and that led to Midnight Oil, which was pretty crazy. <laughs> Something I never thought I would be doing and uh, was one of the best experiences of my whole life, playing Power and the Passion with Peter Garrett was unbelievable um so yeah there was that and then from that I got recommended to do the Jimmy Barnes tour which was another thing that I couldn't quite believe and like as an Australian I mean you're from Adelaide like (laughs) Jimmy was like I'm pretty sure that might have been the first soul music I ever heard was when he did that soul deep album so and you got like a song in a Kellogg's pack or something like his cover of Sign Sealed Delivered (laughs) yeah I I know exactly what you're talking about yeah so it was a time and I just couldn't believe it when I got that gig. It was so, so fun. And, yeah, that was kind of happening while I was making this album. And now I'm, I've toured all last year with the Teske Brothers. I'm on tour with them right now and they're my family and I, I, love, I love them so much. Like I, I feel so privileged to be a part, of, a, part, a part of their story as well. It's so beautiful, yeah. So in addition to um, being on tour with the Teskey Brothers, I should also talk about your debut album, which which is called From the Fire and came out in April. Now, it's a stunning album and honestly a real smooth record, which rewards both mindful and casual listening, sort of like what we are talking about before. But I should say, how did this uh, uh, record come about? Like, What made you go from your Bed I Made EP in 2020 to saying, right, time for an album? Yeah, well, it took, it took a long time and like everyone, everything changed for me in the pandemic. Um, I had a particularly interesting experience because I'd had quite an uh, intense personal tragedy happen just before the pandemic, which sort of fueled this album. So I was living in New York before the pandemic and kind of had to come home because I had no income. I, I was making a living playing music in New York, touring with the Tesco Brothers overseas, but also playing with other bands and doing jazz gigs. and that was suddenly gone and you know I had no money and New York is very expensive so I thought I was coming home for like a month to wait it out and I ended up living with my mum for two and a half years in Melbourne but uh yeah I was really really lucky creative well creative Victoria I got a grant to make this record which meant that I could do what I wanted to do and uh the first song I wrote on the album was a song called Survive which I was really having issues with uh, playing music and finding a reason to play when I didn't have any gigs. And then I just, I borrowed a Korg Kronos from my beautiful friend, Carrie Sutherland, who let me borrow it for all of COVID, which was such a blessing. And I started playing classical piano again every day just because it was so, I, I didn't, feel I could play music but I wasn't emotionally attached to it it wasn't my job it wasn't playing trumpet and I sort of got really into that and then I started playing piano just jazzier stuff uh for fun and then I saw, I wrote this song and it came out and then I sort of remembered how good it feels to create and to write my own music and my my EP had come out and it was a weird time put it, putting out music in like my EP came out in 2020 yeah it did it did everything it needed to do but it was a it was such an intense time for the world it was it was a, it felt strange promoting your own music at that particular time um and I think I had a real I, I still I think 
I really love that EP. I love what I did with uh, my co-producer, Tariq Khan, who's amazing. I, I made that record in New York with incredible musicians. Um, but I think I had this real moment coming back from America, realizing that I was very much an Australian. Uh, like you said, jazz is such a interesting art form and it is so related to a specific community in America. You know, it is African-American music or, you know, I think I had to find my way to express myself that was outside of a specific genre, if that makes sense. I wanted to be authentic to myself and all the things that have influenced me and that I love. So when I started making this record, that was what I was trying to do, to be really authentic and not copy things that I liked, which had been how I'd always made music in the past. Like for Audrey, for example, we would hear songs that we liked, gospel, like modern gospel or synth pop, and we would kind of like not copy the songs but copy those ideas and try and recreate those genres, sort of like we were literally making tunes in different genres. Um, so, yeah, I think when I came to make this record, I had this really personal story that I wanted to get out. And, yeah, I was really trying to let let whatever came to me come to me. And for me, it's almost always harmonic, what, what initially makes me feel things about me. It's always been chords, trusty chords. Uh, that is Thanks for the plug. Started, yeah, <laughs> started the process for me. That was a very, like, um rambling answer but yeah it was a weird it was a weird time and once I started uh I wrote a few songs and then I realized I they were all fit together and I wanted to make one uh, one cohesive album because this album was also done almost entirely solo isn't it like I might be wrong but almost every facet was handled by you kind of I had my amazing band play uh uh, like all the rhythm section players um and incredible engineer Russ, uh, Russell Caucus, who engineered in the studio and uh, mixed it. But I was very much creative control. Uh, yeah, it, all the decisions were mine and that was a very purposeful decision. And I have loved all the people I've made music with in the past, but I think, honestly, I, I think I might have said this in my gear talks interview but gender was a big factor for me I find the production space is still just incredibly male dominated and people just don't seem to believe that women have the ability to produce and I think uh, subconsciously I had some sort of internalized misogyny or sex sexist thinking that made me think that I needed a male producer and I couldn't do it on my own and I thought about it and I was like I know what these guys are doing like I know how to use the AWs. I know how to write music. Like I absolutely can produce my own record, um, and I should because uh, I would tell another female artist to do the same. Um, and it's the proudest. I've never been more proud of myself, um, and I've never enjoyed doing anything more. I don't necessarily think I wouldn't want to work with another producer in the future, but I I loved having creative control and. Uh, I really, you said before I was humble, but I'm not going to be right now. I really exceeded my expectations of myself because I hadn't tried these things before, like string arranging and making decisions about how to record the strings or how, where to put mics and things. But I, I knew enough and with good people around you and the internet to Google questions and watch YouTube tutorials, it's, it's easy to learn those things. Like easy, I shouldn't say it's easy, but if you want to do it, it's fun and you can and you should never let yourself get gaslit out of producing or making your own record if you want to. Yeah, I mean, hell, this I mean, this podcast itself would be nowhere if not for YouTube tutorials and everything. Um, some, of, <laughs> some of the production of the audio yeah. it was pretty shoddy in the first round. But, I mean, that also must be such a <laughs> such a liberating feeling as well to, to be the one to sort of say, you know what, not only am I making an album myself, but I'm the one in control here. Like, I mean, because as, as you said, yeah. like you obviously love playing with other musicians, but to have that ability to say, you know what, I'm going to make these decisions here. This This melody line is mine and mine alone. That must just feel so liberating. It honestly, it's the best feeling I've ever had in my entire life. Was the first time I listened to this record on vinyl. 
I, I just I cried. But also the first time I heard the strings play in my arrangement. It's the whole thing has been so emotional and hard as well because it's like you put so much of yourself into it. But I, I mean, I remember the first time I sent it to anyone, the record, and the first thing they sent back to me uh, was, Who produced this? And I wrote back, Me. I produced it. And they were like, Wow. And then they're like, Who did the, all the string arrangements? And then I got to write back again, Me. And I was just sending those emails like euphoric. At, I just couldn't believe that I'd actually done it and I got to say that this was mine and yeah it's I'm very very proud and grateful that I had people around me particularly some amazing male musician friends that were like you should do this yourself or you don't need you know um, I, I am quite self-deprecating but they were very like what you don't need someone else to do this for you you can do it so I'm really grateful for my friends as well. Uh, I mean, honestly, with with the quality of this record, please, please make more. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I would say there's also like some severe perfectionism. Of course. I mean, you're you're a creative person. Everyone has that. Yeah, I was. There. It, there's not not a lot of time that was spent on every single detail. So yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess that that also sort of goes into my last question for the the album as well, which was what what does a record like this say about who Audrey Pound is in twenty twenty four? I think what I, I guess other people will make those decisions, but I think what I wanted it to be was like I don't I love the trumpet. I don't see myself as just a trump a trumpet player. I don't think that's my greatest strength. I I think what I like to do and what I'm best at is music quite holistically and that's what this album was for me um i feel equally invested in the string arrangements the compositions the har- harmonic language the vocals the trumpet and the, the production and those decisions there's one track that i don't play anything on and it's one of my favorite tracks from the album so yeah i think for me it was like executing a creative vision and i think it's the first thing it's the first piece of art I feel like I've made, I think. And I really do think it's a piece of art, which is something I'm incredibly proud of. And I can see myself now and call myself an artist, not just a musician, not just a trumpet player. That's, it's honestly such, such an amazing way to look at it because it, it is truly a work of art. And, I, and I'm not just saying that because we're chatting. It is an album that I've listened to a few times since it's been out, and it's truly wonderful. Thank you. Um, so Thank I guess- you for listening. Oh, not, not a problem. Thank you for making it. <laughs> um, I guess in the interest of time, we should get down to the portion of the podcast from which its namesake is derived. So trusty chords is built around the average chord. Folks who know theory would know your standard chord is built around the first, third and fifth notes for scale. So we're going to extrapolate that a bit for this podcast. Talk about one artist that's impacted you, three albums and five songs. So after this wordy explanation, I should ask the question, who is the one artist you feel has inspired you the most, whether it be personally or creatively? Oh, it's actually just a very challenging question, but I think everyone says that. <laughs> uh, I know. I think it's Herbie Hancock because I just think he he's done everything, <laughs> you know. So he can sort of influence you in every facet uh, as a as a musician, as a composer, and as someone that's just been around for all these epic movements in music. Um, I also just. I've seen him live and the joy in his playing. He's also on a lot of the Miles Davis and Wayne Shorter records, some of my favourite jazz records. Yeah, I just think he's so inspiring, like his life and all the music that he's made. Uh, yeah, Herbie Hancock. Because <laughs> I also feel he's one of those artists as well, which doesn't he doesn't quite get as much acclaim in the mainstream as he deserves. Like everyone sort of looks at, because I think he won that Grammy for that um, that composition Rocket yeah. back in the early eighties. Yeah. But no one sort of looks at all the, the jazzy stuff. It's sort of over overshadowed by more of the the popular awardy stuff, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, and I think like the records that he's made later in life, where he did get sort of, I mean honorary grammys for maybe like they didn't give him grammys in the 60s so now they're giving grammys for river like which was a great album but yeah i think he's he's done a lot to keep jazz relevant i guess i i don't really know but he he's such an icon of this music and he was a part of so many iconic records you know and he just kept reinventing himself like 
some of the 90s Herbie stuff that everyone thinks is really naff, I actually think it's heavy and amazing. And it's just that some of the sounds are a bit weird. <laughs> but, he, yeah, he always sort of is trying to – He's always tr- someone that's always trying to be an artist and take the music forward and willing to take risks, and I find that so inspiring. And then he's just the grooviest of all time. <laughs> when he plays, then you listen to him play keys and you're like, oh, my God, he's so groovy, and then he just plays the funkiest chord you've ever heard, and you're like, how did you hear that, and why does it sound so good? Uh, he's truly just uh, like he's one of those like musical geniuses, you know. That you just sort of like, how do you have so much talent? It's again, it, it's it's always infuriating, isn't it? It it is, and there's also like there's always a new album that you haven't listened to yet, or that you haven't properly checked out. Like this, he made he's made so many records, and you'll listen to this random piano trio record that didn't really make an impact, and then you find one track that has this incredible piano solo. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. And on that, on that topic of records as well, we should look at the next part, which is what are the three albums that have impacted you the most? This could be albums you're always throwing on or something that's integral to the musical evolution. I'm, I'm going to assume that the Hard Groove album might be on here. I was going to say, this is, I think I've already talked about two of them, which is Hard Groove. I think I'm also going to, having just spoken about it, I'm going to say the White Album too. I think I underestimate sometimes how much... I absorbed from that record and how much I love it. <laughs> um, yeah, the White Album and Hard Groove and then uh, Voodoo by D'Angelo. Sure. You're right. Although I just realised having said that, I, I missed my favourite album of all time, which I just sort of took for granted, which is What's Going On by Marvin Gaye, which was definitely the biggest influence on this record, even though I daren't speak the name of my album in the same sentence as that masterpiece. Uh, I, what's going on uh, every now and then I forget and then realise I haven't listened to it for like a year and then I'll listen to the whole thing from start to finish and just cry. Like, I just think it's perfect. Everything about it, that record. So, uh, I mean, I'm doing a little, a little, little bit of math here. That, that equates to four albums. So which one are you sort of swapping out to make it in the, the three? Are we swapping out the Beatles for that I one think, maybe? I think if it's, if it's albums that influenced me more than my favourite albums, then I'd probably take out Beatles. It's very cha- it's very it's, it's painful, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Or maybe I'd take out Voodoo. Maybe I just love listening to Voodoo. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'll go with Hard Groove, The White Album, and What's Going On. There we go. Okay, poor poor D'Angelo. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm sure he'll be fine. <laughs> he's he, all right. He, yeah, he's doing fine. Well, I'm sure lots of other people will mention Voodoo. And lastly, I'd love to know the five songs that you can always turn to, whether it be for comfort, for excitement, anything at all, your five trusty songs. Oh, I love this. I've got different ones for different reasons. Um, oh, perfect. My, if I'm in a, in a bad mood and I need to psych myself up or get happy, when, What a Fool Believes by the Doobie Brothers. Um, I absolutely love that song and it never fails. Like you cannot be unhappy when you're listening to that song. Um, and I love the Doobie Brothers. I love Michael McDonald. Oh, yeah. Um, and not in an ironic way. I just think he's amazing. <laughs> um, then I think a uh, jazz tune that I just listen to and floors me is, um, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think some of the jazz things I feel like. Uh, yeah, After the Rain by John Coltrane. You're right. Is just incredible. Um it's very much a close your eyes, listen to it, and just it, everything about it is so transcendent. Um, yeah, what did I say? What, when a Fool Believes, After the Rain by John Coltrane. Um, Joni Mitchell is like, if I need to have a cry, it's always Joni Mitchell. Of course. And um, a song I really love is The Last Time I Saw Richard, but I actually really like the version from Travelogue. I think it's on Travelogue, one of the later albums after yeah, her yeah. voice kind of broke and it's orchestrated, orchestral. Um, yeah, that really destroys me every time I listen to it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's that. And then a song called Beja Pachido, um, a recording by Milton Nascimento, who's a Brazilian um, singer-songwriter. Um, 
who also made an album with Wayne Shorter. That's how I found out about him. But he's sort of like a Brazilian pop pop star. Like I heard someone compare him to like Van Morrison. He's like the Van Morrison of Brazil, yeah, wow, okay. which is a funny thing. But yeah, he, he's a singer songwriter. And this Beja Pachido, I, I can't speak Portuguese, sadly, but it means like the parting kiss. It's just a very beautiful song written by another amazing Brazilian artist, Tony Nyohorta. So yeah, I, I've always loved that song. Doug DeVries, a great um, Melbourne guitar legend showed it to me when i was in uni and i just loved it i think i've got one more right yes one more it's really hard i think i have to go uh how does it feel by d'angelo and that's less about the songwriting and more about just i think that record is just the grooviest thing ever oh um, i mean d'angelo is such a B, amazing yeah. yeah i mean he, he's such a <sighs> Like I, I managed to see him um, about eight years ago, I think, or no, nine years ago now. And man, he was just such an amazing performer, even sort of like, you know, what, 16 or so years on past, you know, when he sort of like really hit the mainstream and everything. I actually like, you know, I don't want to be that person that like name drops gigs, but I'm going to. I do want to be that person. I absolutely Please do. do. <laughs> like I saw him play, du- I saw him play, when I lived in New York, I saw him play duo with Questlove at the Brooklyn oh, wow. Bowl, which is not a huge venue, but like not. A, it's a kind of a small venue, and it was the best thing I've ever seen. It was so wild, and he went on really late, and it was when he was just coming back, and they just did covers. He did a couple of his tunes, but he mostly just played old soul covers and old like and a couple of Prince covers, and it was just like unbelievable. Left hand bass, like he was playing left hand bass. It was so groovy, so wild. I still can't believe I saw that. And I, I also felt like that um, um, How Does It Feel is a song that also is, sort of, again, overshadowed somewhat by its music video, um, which sort of yeah, made a few yeah. headlines back in the day. Um, but it's yeah. such a wonderful song. I actually song. think that's a real, yeah, I think that's a real shame. But then yeah. I say that as someone that was particularly interested in the video. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean. Like, I don't know. Yeah, I always, I wasn't aware of the music video, so I just came I was to the same. The song, yeah, I, I heard the song. Yeah. I actually like. I've, I've listened to that track a lot, um, and, and you know, it's not Pino playing bass. This is getting super nerdy. It's Raphael Sadiq bass on that track, All right. and like, it's not quite. It it was made a little bit differently to the rest of Voodoo. Like, it's quite, yeah. It, it but it's for me, it encapsulates what was so amazing about D'Angelo, which was just that sense of like. Uh, I, I think of it as like the. The groove is just so wide. Like the beat is so wide in that tune. You can feel all the subdivisions all at once. And like he just floats over the top. Everything he sings is just, every phrase is, is the drums are amazing. It's also quite good to hear someone else mention um, John Coltrane in their five songs because this podcast hasn't been going that long, but we've already had someone else mention John Coltrane. And that was actually that they mentioned Giant Steps as one of their songs. And Oh my God, who was that? It was. Um, yeah, it was Jason Black of Hot Water Music, who was a punk bassist, oh, cool. and he was not the sort of person okay. I was expecting to All be right. throwing down John Col- John Coltrane. I was expecting folks like yourself Heavy. to be choosing. Wow, yeah, that's this is the thing about Coltrane. He's so broad. Like Giant Steps and After the Rain are two very different, like totally oh. different things. Yeah, I mean, it. Yeah, as I was going to say, it just goes to show the impact that he has just across the board. It's uh, he's such an amazing musician. <laughs> He's a goat. Like he's just yeah. the greatest. Which is yeah. Yeah, magic. I mean, like, you know, like like the Beatles, like, you know, all, all these, you know, but jazz about all this other stuff. We could be talking about this for hours, but I feel like I should sort of wrap this up in the interest of time. So I should say, Audrey Pound, I want to say thank you so very much for being generous with your time and for being part of the Trusty Chords podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening to Trusty Chords. If this was an episode that you really enjoyed, I'd be truly grateful if you wanted to take the time to give this podcast a like, follow, share, review on whatever platform you use to listen. I'm also totally fine if you don't do that, but it is often the difference between people listening to this podcast and me recording this intro in my wife's closet for no reason. Your choice. If you're eager to follow along on social media, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at Trusty Chords Podcast, all one word while I'm also on Twitter at Trusty Chords Pod due to an archaic character limit. There's also a blog for this podcast on my own website, which is tylerjenke.com. It's T-Y-L-E-R-J-E-N-K-E slash Trusty Chords Podcast, all one word. 
That's where you'll find entries on each episode as it goes live on a Friday morning, and a list of all the artists, albums, and five songs chosen by artists each week, and the accompanying playlist too. You can also find a link to the Buy Me A Coffee platform, where, if you feel so inclined, you can throw me a few dollars to keep this podcast running. As always, there's no obligation at all to do so. As usual, thanks to everyone who continues to listen, message, or just support this podcast in any way. You're the reason I keep doing what I do. Lastly, I need to thank Audrey Pound for being such a wonderful guest this week. I also need to express my gratitude to Sarah from This Much Talent for helping organize the chat as well. But once again, thank you kindly for listening, and I hope to see you all again next week as I continue to celebrate music and those that create it.